got to get started here. We got this is a long message here, so I'm going to try to get going here as quick as possible. Brother Roy, brother Andrew, is that start? I did start that right. The the um, computer. I did start it right. Okay, I figured I did, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Okay, the NSA's watching me. Good. Did they log on? They probably did. Did they sign up? Yeah, if I ever lose my copy, I'll get one from them. What's? Yeah. Yeah. He who owns the gold rules. Yeah. 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 <coughs> it's very true. <coughs> ah. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, we'll have lunch afterwards here, and then uh, we'll get right back into another message on this and have some songs, and, and Brother Russ will sing, and, you know, and, and uh, we'll all sing together some congregations and everything. Then Brother Russ will sing by himself, and uh, <clears throat> no, he won't. He's <clears throat> I might have said it, but... <laughs> So do we. <laughs> He's just as sick as me, man. Listen to him over there coughing and hacking. Man, it's terrible. Hey. Look how happy he is. Why can't everybody be that happy when they come to church? Look at that. <laughs> That's because he doesn't understand what you're preaching. That's why. Yeah, exactly. All right, amen. Is it too cold over there for you all? Is everybody is everybody okay over there? Is it a little cold or what? Because I just got that. Because it gets it's going to get real stuffy in here if that if that door is shut because it was like they had that heat cranked up and it was anyway. But uh, brother Paul, are you okay? <laughs> you need to blank you, brother Paul. <laughs> I told him he came from he came, he went from Texas to Siberia. I told him you can make it this winter here. You'll stay for the rest of your life. You'll be fine. This is the worst winter. <clears throat> Man, oh, I wish this would get over. You know, it was fine yesterday. I wasn't coughing that much. As soon as I woke up this morning, it just started in. It wouldn't stop. So, um, all right. Anyway, uh, the offering uh, box is back there. You put in what the Lord leads you to do there. Uh, let's be faithful with that. And the Lord's been taking care of us like he always does, and we, we're grateful for that. And had a lot of cards and, and messages sent to me here this week, just different uh, things. And actually somebody uh, sent a card for Mrs. Beller, for the Beller family, and wants me. To, they didn't know how to get a hold of them, so they heard about him passing away and, and uh, wanted to be a blessing to them, so they sent me a card to send out to them. So we'll be doing that. We'll be sending that out here this week, and and uh, you know we uh, tomorrow we'll send that out. But uh, CD Ministry is going good. Uh, you know, just getting started. Got to got to make up a bunch. Of, we uh, made up a bunch of them already, but we have some more makeup, and and uh, we'll start. I'll start figuring out the right kind of way to you know do all that here. Where I'm still kind of beginning stages of figuring all that out, but uh, try to keep up with everything and try to ship it all out and. And uh, pray for me this week. I got to get some writing done this week too. So now that I'm not coughing my head off and I can actually concentrate on something, I want to actually get some writing done because I'm way behind on that. So I'm going to get that done here this week, brother Russ. I'm going to get done this week. Amen. <laughs> Have some faith, brother. I'll get it done. But uh, uh, <clears throat> I appreciate their help. They're very long suffering with dealing with me. So I, I appreciate that. I'm not exactly the most uh, uh, detail-oriented guy, and and uh, they they really do make up for that, and I'm very grateful for them and their patience through it all. So, um, just had a lot of things happen with Brother Beller's funeral, put me back, and then getting sick, and you know, just things just man started really uh, catching up to me the last three or four weeks. But but I got to get disciplined to get going on that here this week, and now that I have some time to do that, I'll make the time to do that this week and get done a great portion of that, um, and. Uh, We'll, we'll uh, get moving on that, so praise the Lord for that. Anyway, uh, but uh, let's see, trying to think if there's anything else that we need to pray about. I don't, 
What, you're going to be traveling? You're not allowed to leave. Don't you know you're not allowed to go anywhere? Okay. Oh, you're going hunting, aren't you? Are you having dinner back there with the folks on Sunday? Yeah. Okay. Bobby, yeah, pray for my sister. Um, she's having a rough time. Um, you know, I think it's all the psychotropics and all the drugs they keep putting her on. And, you know, the, yeah, well, she was up at the hospital for a while. They had her on a 72-hour watch, and they sent her to United. Was it United? Is that, or is that what it's called? Up in St. Paul? Yeah, the, the, they had some psychiatrists that got in there, and, you know, when the state gets involved, there's a psychiatrist in there, and that psychiatrist was like, hey, let me play around with this medicine a little bit. So um, this I call them sorcerers, but uh, they're a bunch of sorcerers. But uh, that's what they do anyway, and there's there's not a whole lot you can really do about it because of the way that she is and, and uh, the way that she does things. It's, it's kind of tough. It really is. So just got to pray for her. And uh, you probably won't see her around here very much because, you know, it just uh, – she just can't really handle it, so just pray for her, though, at this time. You know, I haven't heard from them for a little while. Um, I'm assuming they're probably going to be back pretty soon. Yeah, and I don't blame them for sticking out there a little bit longer to make sure most of this is over. Oh, okay, so the, par the park has to be open in order for them to, to uh, be able to get back in there. So, yeah, that's right, and it should be opening pretty soon. I think it's April 15th. I think is the cutoff line, I think, because that, after that, from what I remember or something like that, I, th I think that's the time. So we'll probably see them around May. Uh, I think they're doing okay. I mean, I touched base with them about a month or so ago. But when they're under another watch care, sir, I, I don't really call them a whole lot or anything like that. You know, they, I, I'm assuming they're finding us online and everything, um, the messages and sermons and everything too as well. So, um, But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear from them soon. But keep praying for them. I always pray for them. I pray for them. Um, all the time, so uh, we want to do that definitely. All right, well, let's go to our Bibles, Revelation chapter 17. I need somebody to start that over there, Revelation chapter 17. And uh, <clears throat> why Baptists must preach against Rome, and because of the martyrs. All right, because of the martyrs. And uh, Revelation chapter 17 and verse number 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon, the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus and when i saw her i wondered with great admiration and the angel said unto me wherefore didst thou marvel i will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her which hath seven heads and 10 horns the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Father, please help us to understand this history that we, we are a part of, Lord. Our, our forefathers were a part of. Our brethren were a part of. May we never forget the blood that was shed. Your blood first, Jesus, for dying for us and giving us life and raising from the dead but also those that would follow you. Thank you for their sacrifice for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, their sacrifice was to be a witness for us. But Rome is drunk with the blood of the saints. Rome has always been drunk with the blood of the saints. That is something that you must understand. As we go through this history, a lot of this is going to be reading historical accounts of what took place down through the centuries of how they were martyred for the faith and how they stood strong and how they, they stood against Rome and against that doctrine. And I think about that. Now I think about these Baptist preachers 
that have sh shake have shaken hands with Rome, and they have they they have made themselves in allegiance with Rome, and and even the Protestants now how they are all going back to Rome and and and, and trying to have this this dialogue, so to speak, this conversation. There's no conversation and dialogue needed. The only thing that must be done is Baptists must preach against Rome, point a finger, and say they're of the devil. Amen. That's right. That's right. Now, the sword of Diocletian had now been drawn from its sheath, and there remained nothing but the shedding of blood and murdering and burning in manifold ways, all directed against the innocent and defenseless lambs of Christ, of which we shall directly give some examples. Anthemus, bishop of the Church of Christ at Nicomedia, as also many members of his church beheaded in that city for the testimony of Jesus Christ. A.D. 302. Eulea, listen to this, listen to this, Eulea, a Christian maiden burned with lamps and torches and suffocated thereby for the faith in Christ at Emerita in Lusitania, Lusitania AD 302. At this time, there was a Christian maiden called Eulela, not more than 12 or 13 years old, who had filled with such a desire and ardor of, of the Spirit to die for the name of Christ that her parents had to take her out of the city of Merida to some distant country seat and closely confine her there. But this place could not extinguish the fire of her spirit or long confine her body for having escaped on a certain night she went very early the following day before the tribunal and with a loud voice said to the judge and the whole magistrate, Are you not ashamed to cast your own souls and those of others at once into eternal perdition by denying the only true God, the Father of us all and the Creator of all things? O oh, ye wretched men, do you seek the Christians that you may put them to death? Behold, here am I, an adversary of your satanical sacrifices. I confess with heart and mouth God alone but Isis, Apollo, and Venus are vain idols. The judge before whose trial she spoke thus boldly was filled with rage and called the executioner, commanding him to take her away speedily, strip her and inflict various punishments on her, so that she, said, said he, may feel the gods of our fathers through the punishment and may learn that it will be hard for her to despise the command of our prince, Maximian. But before he allowed matters to proceed so far, he addressed her with these soft words. How gladly would I spare thee, O oh, that thou mightest renounce before thy death thy perverse views of the Christian religion. Reflect once that great joy awaits thee, which thou mayest expect in the honorable state of matrimony. Behold, all thy friends weep for thee, and thy sorrow-stricken, well-born kindred sigh it after thee, that thou art to die in the tender bloom of thy young life. See the servants stand ready to torture thee to death with all sorts of torments. For thou shalt either be beheaded with the sword or torn by wild beasts or singed with torches, which will cause thee to howl and wail because thou wilt not be able to endure the pain or lastly be burned with fire. Thou canst escape all these tortures with little trouble if thou wilt only take a few grains of salt and incense on the tip of thy fingers and sacrifice it. Daughter, consent to this, and thou shalt thereby escape all these severe punishments. This faithful martyr did not think it worth the trouble to reply either to the entreating or the threatening words of the judge, but to say it briefly, pushed far away from her and upset the images of the altar, censor, and sacrificial books. Instantly two executioners came forward who tore her tender limbs and with cutting hooks or claws cut open her sides to the very ribs. In her account of baptism for the year of A.D. 606, we made mention of the celebrated teacher and Bishop Adrian and stated from a certain letter sent by Gregory the Great to John, Bishop of Larissa, that Adrian was accused of having refused baptism to infants. But it seemed it did not stop at, at said accusation, but, they, but that they to all appearance proceeded further and more severely and cruelly against him, for the above was imputed to him for a crime or a heinous sin. Hence he was criminally proceeded against, which criminal punishment sometimes related to property, but most frequently it was of a corporal or capital nature. Moreover, though said punishment was ordained for great crimes and criminals, yet in cases of Adrian we can perceive it was founded on nothing but his disregard and rejection of infant baptism. 
as appears from the sequel of Gregory's letter to John, which reads thus, Pursuant to the chapter of criminal matters, a charge was referred against Bishop Adrian or brought against him by way of punishment concerning the children which by his orders had been kept from baptism and died in darkness unbaptized or unwashed from the filth of sin. See, they punished him. Why? Because he would not accept the Roman Catholic infant baptism. He wouldn't allow his flock to be baptized. He wouldn't baptize children. Do you see that has always been the great identifying badge of the whore? Infant baptism. And don't get mad at me. God calls it a whore too. Albert of Gaul, for opposing the Roman superstitions, cast into prison at Fulda, in which he, to all appearance, perished through want about the close of the year in 750. Enlightened by the heavenly radiance of the doctrine of the apostles, Albert, with voice and pen, had again and again reproved the errors and superstitions of the Roman church. Namely, that priests or teachers should not be prohibited from marrying, that the relics or bones of the saints ought not to be venerated, that images should not be worshipped or salutated as a religious service, and that the Pope has no right to the primacy or supremacy over the church. He condemned the masses for the dead purgatory, etc., as human inventions. <coughs> Excuse me, sounds like a Baptist. He rejected as unnecessary and superstitious ceremonies the imposition of those hands making the sign of the cross, confirmation, and in, in short, all such things as are practiced in popery for purposes of confirming infant baptism. And Boniface, the papal legate, therefore accused him to the Pope, fabricating and disseminating many slanders which were spewed out against him as bitter gall. The Pope lost no time nor sought to delay the matter, but immediately condemned him. Unheard upon these false accusations and the above-mentioned articles, excommunicated him and sent the sentence of excommunication to said false accuser, namely to Boniface, his dear legate, that the latter should publish it against Albert throughout France. Hence it is that the papists number him among the heretics, though they fail to show what heresy it was, for which he was condemned and thus shamefully excommunicated, which matter must be gleaned from other writings." Having received said letter containing Albert's excommunication from the Pope, Boniface not only caused the same to be published throughout France and disposed him from his ministry, but also incarcerated him in the monastery in which imprisonment he publicly died of he probably died of hunger, thirst, and diverse wants. They just you know, hunger is dying of starvation is one of the worst ways to die. It's one of the most slow, painful ways to die. And that's what they did to him. Why? Because he rejected the Pope and he rejected infant baptism, and he re re rejected the damnable heresies of Rome. That's why. And by the way, Rome has never rescinded any of these things. Rome has never said we were wrong. Ever. Having received said letter, so anyway, uh, number five, Clement of Scotland, a companion of Albert, excommunicated, then burned as a heretic by the Romanists, according to the testimony of the ancients. Oh, he's a heretic, burn him. That's yeah, like today people like to throw around that heretic charge, but they don't like to back it up. So don't be offended. I've been, I've been called that a lot. Oh, you're a heretic. Okay, we'll prove it. Silence. Why? Because it's a baseless charge, just like Rome used to give. Still gives. See, Vatican II, we'll have, a, we'll have a sermon why Baptists should preach against Rome and then cover Vatican II, because that's important for you to understand the shift and the change that took place at Vatican II and what their goal was. Infiltration, Jesuit style. That's what the goal was of Vatican II. But you won't understand Vatican II. You won't understand the evolution of Rome. You have to understand what the, what Vatican II did and uh, the, the main players of the game, Billy Graham and others, that all kind of helped. All right, for the same reason, namely for opposing and rejecting the Roman superstitions, when Clement, having come from Scotland, had joined the aforesaid Albert as a companion and united with him in regard to doctrine, he not only began, began but ceased not even as the friend whom he had found, to combat with the spiritual armor and, if possible, to overcome in an evangelical manner the Pope and the Roman Church in various points, touching mostly her ceremonies. I mean, they, they preached against Rome's ceremonies? 
Thereupon he was also accused and put to death in such a manner as in proper place we presently hope to show. The accusations brought against him were of the same nature as those preferred against Albert, his companion, which was not at all strange since he had placed himself under Albert, not only as a friend and companion, but also as a disciple. For this reason, the Pope, through the accusation of Boniface, the papal legate, pronounced the same excommunication against him. But when he presented himself for the purpose of vindicating his conduct in a full synod, Boniface prevented him from taking this course, making the people believe that it were not lawful, for, lawful to admit a heretic who had been excommunicated or excluded from the church to divine worship or to an assembly. Yea, that such a one should not be permitted to have the benefit in whatever this might consist of the laws or ordinances of the church. So what he's saying is you're not going to be able to speak to defend yourself. Seeing that this pretense, his lips were sealed, making it impossible for him to properly defend himself, he had recourse to his pen and wrote a book concerning the matter against him. Finally, it stated that maintained that this steadfast witness of Jesus Christ was burned as a heretic by the Romanists, even against the will of Pope Zechariah, about A.D. 750 or a little after. In A.D. 1022, near the close of the year, it seems, or at least A.D. 1023, they were apprehended and publicly burned in France in the presence of King Robert on account of heresy by the papists, certain 14 persons some of whom were common people, while the others were of noble descent, and of whom the chiefest was called Stephan. They were accused of having spoken evil of God and the holy sacraments, that is, of holy baptism, infant baptism, that is. For this was the, what the papists generally practiced, and concerning which disputes were of frequent occurrence. And of the body and the blood of the Lord, that is, the sacrament of the altar, which the Romanists were wont to call the body and blood of the Lord, also of marriage, the, this appears, says the writer, to have been the first execution, that is, by burning, of persons accused of heresy in the Roman church. Continuing, he says, in an old book we find an account that this heresy was brought into this country from across the sea, namely from Bulgaria. That thence it was spread into other provinces where it subsequently was much in vogue, principally around Toulouse and Gascony. Well, who are these guys? Well, you're going to find out who these guys are. These guys traveled around quite a bit. These guys are none other than the Albengis and the, and the Waldenses and those guys. They, they got around. Those old poor men of lions and those men around 1100, they got around. Those Waldenses, they got around. And they traveled around and they preached and they died. And they were murdered. <coughs> and they had to be very careful who they trusted. Sometimes they lost their lives and their heads. Touching the accusations were brought against the aforementioned 14 persons, they were as it related, that they had spoken against the article concerning God against the holy sacraments, <laughs> against marriage on the account they were afflicted upon with very cruel and dreadful, miserable death by fire. But what they believed and maintained with regard to said points, the layman and the nobles, the papist writer says, in the confession of the Albengeses, Albenge I can't say that right today, and the Waldenses, he, who held the same belief, since said persons are held to have been the firstlings of those who maintained the, that doctrine through long before their general rising. They're, these men were the same men that were persecuted by the Pope. They were persecuted by the papacy. They hunted them down. Why? What did they believe? They believed the Bible. They believed salvation, and they did not believe the Pope. Why is this history so suppressed today? Why is it that fundamental pastors don't preach on these martyrs? Why is it that they never talk about them? I will tell you why. Because the doctrine of the martyrs is the doctrines from the scriptures, and the doctrine of the martyrs would reprove much of the nonsense that goes on today. Because there would have to actually be a soberness and a seriousness in the church of God over the word of God and over its practice. That's why. It would actually mean something. Then it will be seen that they believed and spoke nothing but what we at the present day believe and speak. Also as regards to baptism, that they baptized believers and opposed infant baptism. And touching the Lord's Supper, that they observed it according to the institution of Christ, but rejected the, ma the mass and transubstantiation. Again, that they denied revenge, the swearing of oaths, auricular confession, the invocation of departed saints in purgatory. What they believe? What you believe? That's what they believed. They believed what, what you believed. They denied the swearing of oaths, the auricular confession. No, I don't have to go confess, confess to a priest. Why do you think a priest wanted confession and all that? Why do you think they want those things? 
control. They're, they want to be the lords over your conscience. Why? Because they can control people with that. That's what they do. They control. Many of the follow, followers of the Berengaris called Berengarians, anathemized by the order of the Pope at, at Piacenza in Italy in 1095 and afterwards persecuted unto death about A.D. 1100. So we're following it down the line. It is stated after the death of this man, his doctrine spoken of above, uh, reference to baptism and the supper against the belief of the Roman church, gained much favor among his followers who were, who were called after his name, so that England, France, Italy, Spain, and Germany, and even the Netherlands became filled with it. A certain writer said they did not adhere to the Baron Garris as to a reed which is swayed by the wind, and their faith did not rest on men, however pious or godly these might have been, but upon the pure word of God which abides forever. I mean, they actually believed they had the pure words of God. Hence, Pope Urban II, A.D. 1095, by constraint, as it were, convened a great council against them in the city and in, in Italy, to which they, they, there came many bishops from Italy, Burgundy, France, Germany, Bavaria, and other countries, so that there was no ch church large enough to hold all these people, but they had to meet without the city in an open field. And Bertolo says this, that in the council a canon or rule was established by which the views of the Berengaris, which were called the heresy, were again, were again as had repeatedly been done previously, anathemized or cursed, but the views of the Roman church confirmed as a precious matter. So they said they, they doubled down on their stand of their wickedness and their false doctrine, and they, they, they put out a bull to put to death and curse as heretics these baptized believers. Nothing's changed. Protestants are still cursed by Rome. Baptists have always been hated by Rome. Always. <clears throat> Here it came, the great persecution and dire distress arose, particularly about A.D. 1100, so that at first some were exiled and here and there from the Roman dominion, some expelled and men and some were punished with death, yea, with death by fire, as shall appear more fully in the account of the martyrs in the following century. We read in the ancient chronicles in, in the year 1135, several persons were burnt alive by the emperor Lotharius, concerning which in the chronicle in particular expressly mentions that they were burnt as heretics. However, in what their alleged heresy consisted is not clearly expressed. This, however, is certain that they separated from the Roman church and opposed her errors. So they spoke out against it? No, you, you don't understand. See, just, just, just go on and do right, but don't speak out against it. Don't, just don't talk about that stuff. But just, you know, just do right, and then you don't have to do that. And then you don't have to really, because you don't want to alienate anybody. Yeah, you do. You want to alienate error. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful dark works of darkness, but rather reprove them. You can't just do right and not reprove evil. You are commanded to go beyond just doing right, but to reprove that which is wrong. That's the command of God. <coughs> Excuse me, that's his command. Abraham Malinus concludes from the circumstances mentioned there with regard to them that they were... Berengarians or followers of him, for says he, the reader must know that after the, his death, many death, very many were condemned as heretics simply because they had the same belief, respecting the Lord's Supper and opposed the bread god of the Mass. What's the bread god of the Mass? The little cookie god. The little cookie god of Rome. You know that little weird white sun disc? Well, that's, that's, that's God to them, and they're actually eating Jesus. That's the way for God. That's right. And that's, that's what they believe that is. But that's nothing but heresy that's been old from Babylon. That comes from Babylon. It, 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 nothing's new. It's all the same thing. But they have that little cookie God there, and that makes it. And then they have the wine and the blood and everything. That's, that's, they believe that. Well, see, these guys are like, we don't believe in any of that garbage. We're not, we're not, we don't do that. We, we observe the Lord's Supper. We don't observe the cookie God. Amen. We, don't we, do, we, don't follow, we don't follow the cookie God. We observe, we observe the Lord's Supper, not the cookie God. Amen? So they, they, what happened to them because they did that? They died. They died. 
You know, pastors never do explain today the difference in the Lord's Supper and the Mass. I never hear them talk about trans, uh, transubstantiation or any of those things. You never hear doctrinal teachings and explanations of the difference of those two. That no, they don't observe the Lord's Supper. They don't have the Lord's Supper. They have the Supper of Devils. They have the table of devils. Then somebody asked me, they said, well, how come you don't have open communion? How come you don't have close communion? Why don't you have those things? Well, very simply, I can't have those things. We can't have those things here. Why? Because, first of all, right, we're not authorized to. We're not, I, we don't give the supper to people we don't know. Why would we? Why would we absor observe the ordinances with people that we don't even know? Well, it says, let, let a man so examine himself. It does say that, but it also says that the church has the oversight of discipline. So how can I, how can I avoid 1 Corinthians chapter 5 to get to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? See, you can. That's why you read the whole book. And you understand the teaching from the whole book. If you shirk your responsibility in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, by the time you get over to 11, you've got no oversight, so you're just letting everybody come in. See, so you've skipped some teaching. You've skipped some major portions of Scripture. If you're to discipline the unruly believer, how can you do that when you're inviting people to the table that don't even you don't know? So let me guess. They need oversight, but nobody else does? So your people get oversight, but somebody else can just come off the street and say, hey, we want to have the Lord's Supper with you. We want to observe communion with you. No, how can you? I'm not being, that's not to be unkind. That's not to be rude to anybody. That's not to be any of those things. It's to be biblical. Amen. Arnold of Brescia, you've heard of him before, Arnold. Arnold was a great uh, Baptist, uh, Anabaptist or Waldensian, whatever you want to call him. But, but uh, after much persecution, he was burnt at Rome for his views against infant baptism, the Mass, etc. In our account of those who opposed infant baptism in the 12th century, we made mention for the year 1139 of one Arnold, a lector of Brescia in Italy, and, and stated that having been instructed by Peter, he, Peter Alber, Alberlard, he, besides the doctrine he maintained against the mass and transubstantiation, also taught against infant baptism, on account of which Pope Innocent II commanded him to be silent. Let me ask you a question. Why is it that these men taught against those things and men today don't teach against those things? So everybody just thinks a church is just a church. Well, this church is the same as that church. We're all called the church. We all live in a yellow submarine. Right? No. There's not everything that calls itself a church is a church of the living God. The pillar and the ground of the truth. Amen. There's a distinction there. And these men taught the doctrinal distinctions. And they stood up against the doctrinal distinctions of the day. But men that do that today are hated for it, just like they were then. Among their own Christian brethren, they're hated for it. Amen. Oh, just don't start getting into the doctrinal issues. I told a brother today on the phone, he called me up, he said, yeah, Pastor, he's studying, he's reading, he's, he's reading a lot of Baptist history. I said, uh-oh. You're going to start believing that. It'll change you, change your practice. Because you'll start seeing that they believe the Bible, and they suffered for it, and there's a lot of rich doctrine in there that they followed, stuff that's been kind of, I did, not lost because the Bible's true, but stuff that has been veiled purposely for years, but now comes out for all to see. When you start studying it, it makes a difference, don't it, Brother Rust? If you don't think so, he wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for studying those things. God led him here, yes, but he was studying those things, started looking into those things, and it just it solidified it. It, it just it showed him what. That's right. He believed the Bible first, but it all just kind of came together, didn't it? Amen. Anyway, these men opposed it. Therefore, they fled into Germany of, or Switzerland, there, where for a time he continued to teach. Thence, after the death of aforesaid pope, he came to Rome but obtaining there an incredible number of followers and being severely persecuted by the popes Eugenius and Adrian, he fled to the emperor Frederick of Barbo Barbarossa, hey, what a name, who delivered him into the hands of the pope, and thus he was finally at Rome, placed to the stake, burnt to ashes, and the ashes thrown into the Tiber. 
lest the people should show him honor. It is recorded that, his, that this occurred A.D. 1145 after he had, as his reckon, strenuously maintained the above doctrine for about six years and that he held on as long as he could. But what were they put to death for? Doctrine. Here people say, well, you, people can't handle doctrinal preaching. Then maybe people need to grow up. Yeah, get saved, you'll understand it. You'll want it then. You'll have a desire for it. I just, I want to feel good. Well, I do feel good when I learn the truth. After I have to get right, but I mean, <laughs> I still feel good. But notice he was. But did you notice here that that he fled to another country, and the ruler of that country gave him over to the pope? Do you understand why? Do you get it? That he was under the pope's authority. That's what they believe. That's what they follow. Abraham Alinus, writing of the beliefs of Arnold, says this, He also taught quite differently concerning the sacrament of the altar and notice of infant baptism from that which was taught the Roman church at that time. He doubtless in his respect held the views of Peter de Bruce and Henry of Toulouse, of whom we shall speak after, rejecting transubstantiation and denying the Mass as a sacrifice for the living and the dead, and that either baptism of the faith of, of others saves... No, either the baptism or the faith of others saves infants, right? He was denying infant baptism. Abraham Linus, who states this concerning the belief of Arnold. You know, he goes on to explain a little bit of Arnold's beliefs. All right, uh, further observations in regard to the manner in which he maintained, promulgated, and incul incul inculculated said doctrine and himself kept it to, him, to this end, as well as what happened to him on his account, that is, all the circumstances and also summary. I mean, he said, listen, this is everything we got on him, but he was, he was butchered. He was murdered. All right, in 1145, Peter de Bruce, formerly a priest and his disciple, both had been monks, were learned men, and greatly censured the papal errors, sp sparing neither great nor small. They called the Pope the Prince of Sodom. <coughs> Sorry, that's funny. Um, <coughs> excuse me, that's funny. That's a good title for him, the Prince of Sodom. Oh, don't be so mean to that man that's sending billions to hell. Be nice to him. Your best life now. They spoke against the mass, the images, the pilgrimages, and other institutions of the Roman church. They renounced infant baptism, saying that none but the believing were entitled to baptism. When Peter had preached about 20 years, namely from before the year 1126 into 1145, the people flocking to him in great numbers, he was finally publicly burnt in the city of St. Giles, also St. Agitus. His disciple, his disciple Henry, who followed him in the doctrine, was in, intercepted and apprehended sometime after by the legate of the Pope and put out of the way so that, the fate, so that his fate is unknown. Oh, he had one of them little Jesuit disappearing acts where one day you're there and one day you're not. And nobody knows where you went and you're just gone. This occurred two years after the death of Peter. After their death, a cruelty of persecution rose against all those who had followed their doctrine, many of whom went joyfully to meet death. In short, however, assiduously the popes, with all their shaven heads, aided by princes and secular magistrates, exerted themselves to exterminate them, first by disputations and then by banishment and papal uh, excommunications, proclamations of crusades, indulgences and pardons to all those who should do violence to said people, and finally by all manner of torment, fire, gallows, and cruel bloodshedding. Yes, so that the whole world was in commotion on account of it. Yet could they not prevent this persuasion from spreading everywhere and going forth into every country and kingdom holding their worship secretly as well as openly with great or small numbers according to the tyranny, cruelty, and persuasion of the dimes. And continuing until the year 1304, of whom over a hundred persons were put to death or burnt at Paris. And thus their descendants, as history states, continued through under much tribulation until this time. What happened was is that they sent out these orders and said, basically, if you'll kill these people, you'll be forgiven. You'll be absolved for the murder, and you can take all their land and everything they have. You can just steal it from them, <coughs> and you won't go to hell for it. <coughs> you won't go to hell for it, and you won't be punished for it. That's why Baptists must preach against Rome. 
It is stated that about 1155 certain peasants called the Apostolics were put to death maintaining the doctrine of the Apostles. There were <clears throat> certain simple but truth-loving peasants who pointing to no other authority of their doctrine nor the author of their doctrine or belief than that to the Apostles called themselves Apostolics as though they would say that their doctrine and belief were derived from the Apostles. Oh, we know who those guys are. Greatly... <clears throat> Abbot of Clairvoy greatly in, invade against them in diverse sermons, calling them, them a sort of despised, boorish rabble. Oh, those idiots. That's, those idiots. They, they, actually believe they, they actually believe what the apostles said. They, they think they actually get their doctrine from the apostles. He calls, it, he calls them ignorant and altogether weak. They, he says, are boorish people, idiots, and completely sold. But they must not be dealt with imprudently. From this it appears that they must not have been so very dull and ignorant after all. He was worried about how he handled them. Well, I've got to figure out how to handle these guys. <clears throat> In the meantime, Bernard continues to rail against them after pap papist papistic fashion. Inqu inquire, says he, for their author. Or what sect are they? Well, where do they come from then, these people? They will not be able to name anyone, he says. But what heresy is there that has not its author from among men? The Manichaeans had Manes and their, their head and master. The Sibelians had Sibelicus. The Arians had Arium. The Nestorians had Nestorus. Likewise, every other similar pest had its separate, ma separate master among men. From which it derived both its origin and name. But what name or title shall be given or accorded to these? None at all, he says, because they received their heresy neither from nor by men. Nevertheless, far be it from us to say they received it through the revelation of Christ. They're saying they got theirs from the Word of God. And they're mad because they didn't get it from a man. That'll make the Pope mad. Continuing, he shows in what their so-called heresy consists in saying they ridicule us. And listen to this. This is what makes him mad. By the way, this still makes him mad. Listen to this. They ridicule us that we baptize infants, that we implore the inter intercession of the saints, and the like. It has been found that they would rather die than be converted, namely to the Roman church. Many a time the believers, he means the papists, by the way, laid hands on some of them, drew them forth, and being asked concerning their faith, they would not confess their wickedness, but openly protested that they taught the true godliness and were ready to die for it. You want to know what I've seen that makes more Protestants and Catholics mad? When a Baptist stands up and knows his heritage and knows his history. Oh, you're just ignorant. You're dumb. You just you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you just don't understand history. You just no. I understand it quite well. I understand it quite well. And I also understand that we didn't come from Rome, and I'm very clear about that. Very clear that we would never bow the knee to Rome. Very clear that Rome is Antichrist. He said, the, the, they, they said, we preach the true godliness and we're ready to die for it. In the meantime, the people that stood by were not less ready to put them to death. And falling upon them, they made these new heretics martyrs of their own faith. It wasn't their own faith, it was the faith of the apostles. Some wonder at this, that when led forth to death, they were not only joyful, but also patient. But it is to be deplored that not only secular princes, but also, it is said, some ecclesiastics, yea, bishops, who ought much rather to have persecuted them, upheld them for lucre's sake, saying, Why should we condemn them as heretics, who have not been convicted of heresy, nor have confessed the same? Thus far, Bernard, who was called the Melifluent, but who nevertheless poured forth nothing but bitter gall against these people. From this it is sufficiently apparent, writes Melanius, that they persecuted these poor people unto death, not on account of Manichaean doctrines, which Bernard unjustly and covertly imputes to them, but because they oppose the Roman church and her heirs. See, here's what they do. Here's, here's one of the tainted parts of Baptist history that you have to understand. One of the tainted parts of it is, is that Rome always falsely accused us, us of other doctrines and tried to say, well, see those Anabaptists? You see those, those, those Waldenses? No, they believe this heresy. They believe that heresy. So they mix it all up, and they try to attribute 
heresies and other things to the to, to those baptized believers that wasn't accurate. It wasn't even real. They didn't even believe it. But they just labeled them that so they could kill them. So that's in the record books. You can see it. These were the same people of whom we made mention in our account of those who in the 12th century opposed infant baptism from Nicholas Sander, who states concerning them that they were called apostolics because they professed to walk in the footsteps of the apostles and declared to hold themselves only to apostolic writings that they condemned infant baptism, purgatory, praying for the dead, invocations of the saints, swearing of oaths, that they accepted no evidence save from the New Testament and went joyfully unto death. Hmm. Gerard, with about 30 others, men as well as women, for maintaining the apostolic doctrine at Oxford in England, are branded in the forehead scourged out of the city and miserably perished with cold. Here's what happened. The doctrines with which they were changed consist, charged, excuse me, consisted of following points that their belief concerning the sacraments of baptism and the supper, as well as respecting marriage, was different from what had been decreed by the Roman church, whom they called the Whore of Babylon. Because she had forsaken the true faith in Christ, they said that she was like the barren fig tree, which our Lord Jesus Christ cursed. They also said that the Pope and the bishops must not be obeyed when they command anything that is contrary to the word of God. Also that monachism was a stinking carrion. Also that all mon monistic vows are vain and useless. Yea, that they foster lasciviousness also. That all the orders and degrees of the priestly dignity are marks of the great beast. Also that purgatory, masses, and church consecrations, worship of the saints, anniversaries for the dead are genuine inventions of the devil. Now, you know, they, they should have been kinder in their speech. They didn't have to say that, did they? They could have said they're just wrong, right? They didn't have to be so direct. They didn't have to be so mean, did they, Brother Paul? They didn't have to be so... They, they should have been nicer and sweeter and kinder. Because then maybe it would have been received. Don't fool yourself. They stood with boldness against error. And they didn't apologize for it either. These, says Malinus, were about the principal articles which the fathers of Oxford Council could not brook, and on account of them they were scourged and banished them out of their country. Yea, let them freeze to death. Kicked them out, let them freeze to death. Yeah, they did. They did. They'd banish them without guns, and they'd send them out to the Indians, and they killed them. Yeah, and they'd slaughter them. The Indians would slaughter them too. They'd take their gun away. When you took in the colonies, when you took a gun away from a from a, from a man and sent him out, that was a death sentence. You were killing him. Yep, they'd be murdered. That's right. They'd be murdered. They'd be dead. They they'd die. They wouldn't make it. Joyful going out of these people to corporal punishment and their miserable death. This sentence having been pronounced, that they were led to punishment. They went with gladness and in great haste, their leader named Gerard, going before them, singing, Blessed are ye, says the Lord, when men shall hate you for my sake. They were then, according to the rigor of the sentence, branded on their foreheads, their leader receiving a double brand, one on his forehead and the other on his chin, as a sign that he was their leader. Thereupon their upper garments to the waist were cut from their bodies, and they were publicly scourged and cast out of the city, but it being a bitter cold winter, and no one showing them the least mercy, they miserably perished by the intense cold which they were unable to bear on their naked bodies. Shake hands with Rome, huh? Want to be a part of that mess, huh? Want to make a peace with Rome. There's no peace for the damned. Ilphonus, by the grace of God, this is a bloody decree of, of uh, oops, get back up here. I'm, I'm almost done here. I'm going to cut it off here a little bit. By the, by the grace of God, King Aragon, to all archbishops, this is a bloody decree that went out against the Waldenses. Now listen to this, in A.D. 1194, this is because of the Pope. You have to understand these decrees either went out by the Pope because of his decrees, or they went out because of the Pope wanting them to do that. So they would put out these decrees. They would bow the, the, the king would bow himself down to the Pope, and he would excommunicate or kill these people. The king of Argon to all archbishops, bishops, and other prelates of the church of our kingdom, to all earls, soldiers, to all the people in our realm and under our dominion, greeting the God and good wishes, excuse me, that the Christian religion may be maintained entire, whereas it has pleased God to place us over his people. It is right and just that we should constantly and accordingly to our ability 
care for the safety, happiness, and protection of said people. Therefore, as faithful successors of our ancestors, and as being just, justly obedient to the ordinances of the church, who have deemed it well that the heretics should everywhere be rejected, condemned, and persecuted from the face of God and of all Catholics, namely the Waldenses. That is, those who do not observe the Sabbaths of holy days of the Roman Church, who call themselves poor men of lions, and all other heretics, of whom there are so many that they cannot be enumerated, who have been excommunicated by the Holy Church from our whole realm and dominion, and enemies of the cross of Christ, dishonors of the Christian religion and our persons, and open enemies of our realm, we command them to depart and flee from our kingdom. If from this day on anyone shall receive said Waldenses, or other heretics, or whatever confession into this house, or hear their pernicious preaching in any place, or give them food, or dare show them any other favor, be it known to the same that he was incurred, that his favor of God and of us, that, and that he is punishable for the crime of less majesty, and that his goods shall be confiscated without appeal. And we command that this our decree and perpetual ordinance in every city, castle, and village of our kingdom and jurisdiction and throughout all the lands of our dominion shall be read and presented every Sunday to the people for observance by the bishops and other rulers of the church and by our governors, bailiffs, and other magistrates, and upon all offenders, the aforesaid punishment shall be afflicted. Be it further known, if any person, noble or ignoble, shall find any of the aforementioned heretics anywhere in our lands, who after three days' proclamation, knowing this is our decree, do not speedily depart, but obstinately remain, and shall inflict upon them the, the, the every, the, them every evil and disgrace and death, maiming alone excepted. He shall have to fear no punishment for it but shall know that he has much rather merited our favor thereby and that his deed is pleasing and acceptable to us. Do you see the, the Luciferian satanic um, design there? We're, we're just going to kill him. And man, if you maim him, better. And if you destroy him, yeah, do it. You have our favor if you do it. Why? They killed him for this because they believe this. They believe God's words. And they knew the Pope was Antichrist. They knew, he was, they knew he was the beast system. They knew what he was. They knew what he was about. Why are so many Baptists fooled today? Why do they think the war with Rome is over? Why? We, however, give these infamous heretics, though through, through above their deserts and against reason, a respite till tomorrow, which is All Saints' Day, to leave or to begin leaving our land. If thereafter any do still remain, we give to each and all of our subjects full authority to rob and plunder them, to beat them with sticks, and to maltreat them shamefully. You guys bored? Tired of hearing it? Hey, here's the decree of Pope Lucius, Pope Lucius III, against the Waldenses, who are called by various names. Five men and three women burnt at Troyes in Champagne in AD 1200. About two years after Pope Innocent III had issued these three bloody letters for the persecution and suppression of the true defenseless Christians, who were commonly called the Waldenses, but by their enemies or persecutors, publicans and sinners, it came to pass in the last year in the 12th century, namely AD 1200, that in the city of Troyes in Champagne, there were apprehended by order of the Pope and the reigning authorities, eight persons, five men and three women, who made the same confession as was stated above with regard to the Waldenses, contradicting the authority of the Popes, infant baptism, the swearing of oaths, the office of criminal authority, and whom the pap papist, author of the large chronicle, Netherlands calls. However, these persons were not accused by the papists of any evil works, but simply on account of their faith, in which faith they desired to remain steadfast unto death, without in any wise departing from it. Hence they were sentenced to fire in said year, and offered their bodies unto God as a burnt sacrifice, having commended their souls unto his hands. How about the origin of the Inquisition against the Waldenses? Listen to this. Pope, A.D. 1190. We desire that you and your fellow bishops, by your prudence, shall guard the more vigorously against the, mal the malady, meaning the doctrine of the Waldenses and the Albengeses, and oppose it the more strenuously as you see the more reason to fear that the sound part of the body may become infected by the disease, lest by such co contagions, which spread gradually like a cancer, the minds of the faithful become infected by a general corruption. Therefore we send you brotherly love. Oh, 
and charge you most earnestly by this apostolic letter that you do your utmost to exterminate all heresies and banish from your province all those that are contaminated therewith and that against them and all those who are contaminated therewith or have any fellowship with them or who are openly suspected of having familiar intercourse with them, you do not only exercise all the rigor of church discipline without intervention of Aeneal, but also, if necessary, subdue or punish them by the power of the material sword, by princes or by people. And at this same time, many Christians at Metz who professed the same faith, they were called the Waldensians, the, the, the papistic author of the large Belgic Chronicle, upon the authority of the ancient historian, calls them Waldensians sect, and says that certain abbots were sent to preach against them, who burnt some books translated from Latin into their mother tongue, and thus extirpated in said, the said sect. And then we're coming up, we're almost here, A.D. 3, 1370. At this time, writes Jacob Marining and others, John Wycliffe, a teacher in England and pastor at Lutterworth in the bishopric of Lincoln, taught, among other things, that baptism is not necessary to the forgiveness of original sin, thereby sufficiently opposing, says rejection in infant baptism, which is founded upon the forgiveness of original sin. On this account, 41 years after his death, his bones by order of the Pope were exhumed, burnt, and ashes thrown into the water. Wow. William Thorpe was put to death and burnt for the faith in England, 1407. Now when the abomination of desolation through the papists began to exalt itself more and more over the true faith, it, it, it occurred about A.D. 1397 that a God-fearing pious man named William Thorpe, formerly a priest, was sorely persecuted for the truth of the gospel, particularly for his belief against the sacrament of the altar, image worship, pilgrimages, the power of the priests, the swearing of oaths. Of these articles of his ac accusation, especially in his belief against the swearing of oaths and what is alleged against it by opponents, we have already given an explanation in the presentation of faith. However, notwithstanding that he was already imprisoned upon the intercession of some well-disposed persons. So anyway, basically they put him, you know, they, they put him to death for the faith. Um, the archbishop... The archbishop, in the meantime, a number of disorderly persons having crowded into the prison, some demanded that he should immediately be burnt. Others that he should forthwith be thrown into the sea, which was nearby, and drowned. In his dreadful uproar, a priest from their midst fell upon his knees before the archbishop, entreating him that he might do his utmost for this William Thorpe to convert him by the reading of his matins or morning prayers, which he should perform for him, saying, I venture to promise that after three days he will change so remarkably that he will not refuse to do anything for the archbishop. But the archbishop, filled with anger, raged on with undiminished fury, threatening the martyr that he would see to it that he should get his deserts. Thereupon this pious witness of Jesus, as he refused to apostatize, was most cruelly maltreated in the prison in the castle of Saltwoden. Some hold that he was burnt soon after that severe examination, the month of August of said 1407. Another man, a tradesman, was condemned as a heretic by the Roman bishops and delivered to the secular judge because he believed and said that the bread in the Lord's Supper was given for memorial, thus denying transubstantiation or the essential change of the bread and the body of Christ. For this he had suffered a slow and dreadful death by fire. A great number of Christians in 1428. I'll not read that one. I, wonder, I do want to read to this trial, though. Uh, a short thing about this trial here. I'm going to skip some of these here. They took a man in A.D. At this time, Jeremiah uh, Savonarelli of Ferro preached throughout the Italy that the Pope was the Antichrist and from which he was burnt at Florence. He wrote some meditations on the 51st and 80th Psalms in which he reproves the tyranny of the Pope and his clergy, saying that they are the boars and wild beasts of the field, which, according to the words of David, have devoured and utterly destroyed the Lord's vineyard and wholly subverted the church of God in the last mentioned compared with... Anyway, but they asked him a question. They brought him to trial, and they asked him a question. Here's what they asked him. What do you think of infant baptism? His answer, I do not think it to be anything but a human institution. Next question, but what then will you prove or maintain your baptism? His answer, Mark 16. Question, what are your views concerning the sacraments? Answer, I have nothing to say of the sacraments of men, but the supper at Christ held with his apostles I approve and esteem, for I think there are many who do not know what sacrament means. That's true. Next question, what do you think of the Roman church? Answer, nothing. But I esteem the Christian church, which is the church of Christ. Next question, what do you hold concerning the host which the priest holds in his hand? Do you not believe that our Lord is in it with his flesh and blood? Answer, 
No. For it is written in Acts chapter 1 that he shall come again in like manner as he ascended into heaven. Next question. What do you think of the Pope? <coughs> <coughs> he doesn't think that. Excuse me. Answer that he is Antichrist. 1 Thessalonians 2.3. You understand he's standing before and he's, he's getting ready to get murdered and he's talking. He knows he's going to die, okay? Question, what do you think of the mass, ceremonies, and confession observed in the church? Answer, nothing, since the tree from which they sprang is good for nothing. Then they wanted to know this. Question, where were you baptized? Answer, my lords, if you know it, why do you yet ask me? The bailiff then said, I adjure you by your baptism that you tell us where you were baptized. Answer, my baptism I hold to be good and right, but your adjuration I do not regard. <laughs> then they, then, they then read to me the names and surnames of all that had been baptized with me and said, Asuras has confessed it to us. I then said, it is true. Who baptized you? Answer, it does not behoove me to tell. Question, we shall make you tell. Answer, my flesh is before you. Do with it as you please. Mm. Think about it. I mean, there was other, I mean, there were so many other martyrs. But just remember, Baptists must preach against Rome because of the martyrs, because of a bloody trail. Because I believe it's going to be used in the end times. I believe the Pope, the false prophet, the false beast, the false system will be used to usher in the Antichrist, will be used with all power and authority. If you understood the reach and the arm of Rome and its power, you would understand that it's only veiled for a short time. But as you see the whole religious world flock to Rome, and you see this Pope running around like a rock star. And everybody likes him. Everybody likes him. Even many Baptists like him. I heard a Baptist man tell me one time, he said, well, that Pope, he's not a bad guy. Oh, come on, you're, you're being too hard on him. He's not that bad of a guy. I heard him preach the gospel. Fundamentalism has fooled a lot of people, though. If you just say 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's the gospel. So the Pope just says something like that, and there you go, that's it. That's how shallow the doctrine of salvation is today. And he doesn't believe that. The Pope doesn't believe the gospel. He's Antichrist. He has Satan's gospel. And Rome is the mother of all harlots and should be preached against. It should be made clear. The doctrine should be made clear, which is what we are going to do. We are going to make the difference, the difference very clear in the truth and error. And I'll tell you why next, next in the afternoon. But I'll give you a hint. It's because there's 1.1 billion people that are stuck in it and are going to die and go to hell. And the last thing they need is some wishy-washy Baptist preacher they won't stand up and preach directly against it and be clear in what they say. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for these that gave their lives for the truth. Lord, they didn't just die because they wanted to. They died for the faith. They contended for the faith. Lord, help us. We have Christians today that despise it. They despise standing up for the faith. They despise bold preaching. Well, they would despise their forefathers then who shed their blood for you. <clears throat> Help us, Lord. Bless the food that we're about to receive and the fellowship that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.